Hello, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to our webinar today. My name is Megan Waters, and I serve as a senior policy advisor to the FAIR Initiative. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating today's discussion on One Health and Food System Transformation. Uh, just a teeny bit about the FAIR Initiative. Uh, the FAIR Initiative is a $70 trillion investor network committed to harnessing the power uh, of capital to bring about a transition to sustainable and resilient food systems, with a particular focus on minimizing the material and systemic risks to and from agriculture. Uh, so climate change, deforestation, biodiversity loss, zoonotic disease, all of these have the potential of and currently are having negative impacts um, uh, on uh, investments on the greater economy. And so the, the need to transition is looked at very seriously by investors. Um, in today's webinar, we'll be discussing and exploring pathways and barriers to ensuring a comprehensive approach of food system transformation with a view to maximizing co-benefits between food security, One Health, and climate action. Uh, in terms of context, it's worth noting that COP28 is an unprecedented focus on the climate impact of food systems. Over 150 governments, in fact, just today I was told we've reached 160 governments. Oh, forgive me. 160 governments have committed to the leader's statement on uh, climate change and agri-food systems. 151, I believe, have committed to integrate agriculture and food considerations in their nationally determined contributions with a focus also on uh, health issues. Uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization has published its first installment of a roadmap for achieving zero hunger without breaching the 1.5 threshold. Uh, this heightened attention on the need to transform food systems to align with climate goals raises both new opportunities and challenges to the One Health approach, which has also received the endorsement, and that's the one I just mentioned, the endorsement from governments around at COP28. Uh, One Health for those unfamiliar with the term, it underscores the need to consider the interlinkages between human, animal, and environmental health and to avoid unattended consequences from a single lens focus. Uh, for instance, some proponents uh, in aiming to, to reduce climate change indicate that further intensification of animal agriculture could both help reduce the uh, sector's climate impact curb deforestation, and also reduce human-wildlife interactions. However, uh, there are potential One Health risks involved in intensification, depending on the interventions undertaken, of uh, increased um, infectious zoonotic disease and AMR. These need to be taken into consideration in charting a path in order to achieve resilient and sustainable um, uh, food system transformation. So before launching into a rich discussion, and I'm eager to get going and introduce you to the panelists, I'd like to take just a quick moment to thank the Stockholm Environment Institute and also the Government of Netherlands for hosting today's webinar and convening uh, this impressive panel of experts. So now it falls to me to introduce them and then we to, to move into a uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like to introduce Ambassador uh, Marcel Bokerbaum, a permanent resident of the uh, Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United Nations organizations in Rome. Across his 25-year diplomatic career, there are two common threads uh, to his work that, that sort of can be traced, a multi-stakeholder collaboration and an eye toward long-term sustainability. Uh, he was uh, an early initiator of the food system approach with, um, with by convening a workshop, a WEF workshop in Amsterdam back in 2016, and he's continued to carry on this work forward to his current role, combining it with a five-year experience as the climate envoy of the Netherlands um, and as chair of the group of Friends of Biodiversity. He keeps pushing boundaries and conventions uh, to, bring thing, to bring change about, which he does not believe is happening quickly enough. Uh, Marcel, thank you for being here. And uh, let me move quickly uh, to, to um, Nitish uh, Debnov, who is Associate Fellow of the Global Health Program at Chatham House. Uh, he's also a member of the One Health High Level Expert Panel. Previously, he serves as a former Vice Chancellor of uh, Chattogram Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, National Coordinator of One Health Bangladesh, and Chief of Party of USAID's One Health Activity 
of, at DIA Global. Next up is Cleo uh, Verkau. Um, she's a scientist at the Stockholm Environment Institute and also, uh, sorry, the, the Stockholm Environment Institute's U.S. Center and a visiting research fellow at the Brooks McCormick Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School. She's published extensively on topics from international climate policy and food system transformations. She's served as a coordinating lead author on three UN Environment Programs reports, including the 2023 report, What's Cooking? An Assessment of the Potential Impacts of Selected Novel Food Alternatives to Conventional Animal Products. Welcome to both of you as well. And last, but by no means least, we have uh, Masika Sofia, the Global Health Policy Manager of the World Federation of Animals. Masika is a veterinarian and epidemiologist with a professional focus on demonstrating the value of One Health to address complex health policies and challenges. At the World, health, uh, uh, the World Federation of Animals, she leads strategy development on pandemic prevention, AMR, and the intersection of UNEP's work with the One Health approach. She represents CSOs in the quadripartite-led AMIR multi-stakeholder partnership platform steering committee. She's a trainer with FAO on female leadership in One Health and is a fellow with Gates Foundation's Global Health Leadership, Woman Lift Health, focused on One Health and the gen and gender nexus. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I don't know if we can move the screen so we can see everyone, and then I would be happy to jump into uh, to some questions. All right, um, I guess I'd like, if it's all right with everyone, to do a quick starter round. And for this, I really mean sort of quick. Imagine, without the anxiety of it, but imagine the BBC's put a microphone in front of you and just says, hey, I'd like a quick answer in this, a minute or two. I'm just curious to know what comes to mind for each of you as a pressing current One Health issue related to food systems and what you think are some of the missing key ingredients needed to mitigate this risk. And since, Marcel, I introduced you first, let's go ahead and go in the order in which you were introduced. Yeah, thank you, uh, Megan. And, and thank you also for uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute for co-hosting this with, uh, with the Netherlands. This is a great question to, to kick off with. And, and one thing comes to mind, and that is what's healthy for us is uh, also healthy for, for nature and vice versa. And, and I think you could say that the food system that we have designed and between brackets in, health, in wealthier countries uh, contains too many incentives to promote an unhealthy choice, whether it is in price, in marketing, or even flavor, uh, even our knowledge about the long-term effects of unhealthy foods uh, falls short. And, and I would suggest that governments regulate and tax in such a way that the healthier choices become more attractive. And I hope that becomes part of, of our discussions later. I role for, uh, for governments here. Back to you, Megan. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Marcel. And turning next uh, to Natisha, I believe you were the second person I introduced. So pleased to you for that same yeah. question. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, you know, we talk all about One Health, uh, but also we have to remember that, uh, uh, you know, this nine planetary boundary classes, you know, we have already crossed six of them. And most of them are linked with the uh, uh, food system. And that is very important. And I would like to highlight one particular approach that is what we call agroecological approach. And that is so important with the One Health approach that, you know, the reducing the use of pesticide, herbicides and antibiotic, which can pollute the environment and contribute to all sort of resistance, promoting biodiversity and plant and animal health, which prevents the risk of disease, including you know, zoning disease that can spread between animals and humans, and empowering farmers and rural communities to manage their sort of whole, you know, own food system. And that goes very well you know, with the One Health approach. I will highlight those things later on, uh, but that is what I would like to uh, uh, make uh, as an initial comment uh, that is agroecology and One Health are so complementary and it can go very well together with the One Health sustainability as well as food system sustainability. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
disconnect. Connect. Connect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Everyone out there. Is this better or is it now worse? There's an echo. You should uh, switch off the sound of that other one. I have done so. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Megan, you might have muted it, but maybe also turn off the sound if you haven't done that. Um, I think I've done so now. And thank you, everyone out there in the audience. Deep apologies for that. But there was a noise that we had tried to resolve before we got on with everyone. And I, I think this may have resolved it. So Cleo, please, you to this fast round. Thanks, Megan. Uh, and I'm also really excited that we've we've gotten this panel together. I think it's a very timely opportunity to be talking about these topics, uh, food systems transformation, climate change, food security, and One Health together. Um, and the the issue uh, you, you pointed to in your introduction, that there is more uh, attention now in policy uh, of the need to address food systems uh, in order to achieve climate goals, I think is a really important opportunity. It's, it's kind of overdue in policy that recognition since food systems, agri-food systems represents about a third of global emissions. Um, and within that, animal agriculture represents about 60% of the, the food systems emissions. So we know we need to do something about that climate impact. And at the same time, we've seen um, much heightened attention to the need to um, achieve one health goals and uh, introduce one health approaches to policy. And so because of the, the very strong linkages between animal agriculture and One Health as well, and I'm sure we'll get to that uh, throughout today's discussion, um, there's a real opportunity there to see how can we um, most explore the synergies between climate action on the one hand, environmental action, food security, and One Health. Um, at the same time, there are also risks, I think, because climate action is so interlinked uh, with animal agriculture, One Health is interlinked with animal agriculture. Uh, we need to really be paying attention to both because it's also possible that some of the policies might have uh, adverse impacts or trade-offs if we're not um, thinking about these things holistically. So I'm looking forward to, to teasing that out a bit more in today's discussion. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Cleo. And then on to you, uh, Masika. Thank you so much, Megan, and for the kind introduction. And as Cleo said, this conversation is very timely and very important for everyone uh, with the conversation moving towards uh, climate action. So for me, what comes to mind when I think about uh, current pressing One Health issues with, with relation to food systems is the, and having or growing up in the global South in Africa and seeing the kind of systems that we have here for food systems is the, uh, the push for this homogeneous intensification of livestock farming systems without consideration of different national contexts, different community circumstances, needs, and dy dynamics. It just feels like um, a one-size-fit-all fit all type of solution which is being pushed for livestock intensification. Now, what this kind of system creates or this type of push uh, looks at it unilaterally in a simplistic way when this Livestock intensification is not simple in any way. It's connected to so many different things, including climate action, but it's looked, looked at as uh, boosting production or creating you know, an abundance of low cost food in an obviously growing population that needs to be fed, but it negates looking at the other moving parts that come with intensification of livestock in different countries, in different communities. So I hope we we are able to dive deeper into this conversation as you're talking about it so we can come up with, we can address the different risks, uh, address the synergies and see where we can create a balance to ensure that we ensure food security, but we also protect the, our nature. Thank you so much, Masika. There's two quick things. One was uh, a little bit of my duty as host that I failed to do, which is to let everyone listening know that there is a question box. Uh, and so there's two ways you can communicate one in the chat, people can add comments in the chat, but if you have a question, we ask that you please put it in the question box because it'll make it easier for us to uh, to find it and our goal ultimately will be to answer all the questions uh, at the end of the round of questions I'm asking. We'll open up the floor and we'll look through the questions 
that people have put to us and answer as many of them as we can. Uh, the second the second thing I have the pleasure of uh, mentioning is that um, there was a panelist who was meant to join us and was uh, unable to uh, due to a conflict, uh, Cristina Romelli uh, from the World Health Organization. And she has actually prepared a video for us. Um, and it might be worth doing that as an introductory thing after this first round of questions before we move into other questions. Uh, but I turn to the tech team to just give us a, a thumbs up on whether you'd like uh, to do that. And if we're ready, if not, we'll can do some other questions first. Excellencies, esteemed colleagues and friends, it is an honor to join you from WHO's Department of Environment, Climate and Health on the critical intersections between food system transformation and the One Health approach. This conversation is especially timely in the wake of COP28, where over 150 governments committed to integrating agriculture and food considerations into their next NDCs, and where over 100 more have adopted the Climate and Health Declaration, aligning with our global commitments for staying within the 1.5 degree threshold. Success requires a multi-sectoral, whole of government and whole of society approach with a focus on equity and prevention, which One Health can provide. One Health is defined by the OLEP and endorsed by our four agencies from the quadripartite, is an integrated unifying approach that both recognizes the inter interdependencies between and aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, plants, animals, and the ecosystems upon which we collectively rely. The alarming fact that one in every four premature deaths is attributable to preventable environmental factors is already a clear sign of this inevitable interdependency. As the world came to a standstill at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, WHO launched a manifesto for a healthy and green recovery from COVID-19, outlining six prescriptions and over 80 concrete actions to move forward. The promotion of sustainable food systems was one of its six core pillars because we cannot turn a blind eye to the realization that our current global food system introduces numerous direct and indirect health risks to people and all components of biodiversity through its production, consumption, and supply chain processes. Land use changes such as deforestation have been central to many past and present infectious disease risks, both vector-borne diseases such as malaria and zoonoses like Ebola, SARS, and Nipah virus. At the same time, our unsustainable exploitation of aquatic resources by overfishing uh, through unsustainable fisheries and unsustainable ag aquaculture practices not only threaten our precious ecosystems and the health protecting services that they deliver, but also pose threats to food safety and security globally and jeopardize the livelihoods of many coastal communities and small island developing states that heavily rely on aquatic species. Against this backdrop, the unregulated trade of wildlife and domesticated animals, invasive alien species, the overuse and misuse of antibiotics in livestock production systems, and the proliferation of industrial monocultures often focused on small and lucrative numbers of crops further exacerbate these health challenges. Conversely, biodiversity, including genetic diversity of foods, is crucial but often overlooked. Today, the diversity of species used for food has been drastically reduced so that only three staple pr crops provide over half of the world's calories derived from plants. In fact, only 12 crops and five animal species provide 75% of all food produced, much of which is actually for livestock feed. This narrowing of our genetic food basket makes our crops more vulnerable to pests and disease, decreases the resilience of food systems, and contributes to the waste of one third of all food produced globally. 
It also exacerbates pressures on soils, forests, and oceans, which act as natural carbon sinks and are critical sources of wild foods and traditional food cultures. In addition to these significant pre pressures, the practices drive up greenhouse ga gas emissions, a quarter of which already results from agriculture and land use change. And as climate change pro progressive, progresses, soil productivity declines, water scarcity and desertification increase, and harmful chemical inputs become more and more widespread. The health impacts are far-reaching as well. Based on conservative estimates, diet-related diseases alone are responsible for over 10 million premature adult deaths, or at least in um, so are the such are the figures for 2017. But where there are great challenges, there are also great opportunities. The One Health approach enables us to tackle the root causes of often concurrent health threats associated with our food systems, including both infectious and non-communicable diseases, as well as antimicrobial resistance, food and nutrition insecurity, and diet-related diseases. Harnessing the areas of expertise from different sectors makes it possible to develop effective and more evidence-based strategies for disease prevention and health promotion. There are multiple key opportunities to adopt an inclusive One Health approach focused on prevention. For example, the Initiative on Climate Action and Nutrition, also known as ICAN, launched at COP27, offers an opportunity to connect actions for climate mitigation and adaptation with efforts to improve nutrition by outlining de deliverables for monitoring progress, providing technical support, and practical examples for more integrated action. Also, the Quadripartite Alliance on One Health launched its very first joint plan of action on One Health in 2022, and at COP28, also launched an implementation guide to support more integrated One Health activities in different countries and across sectors. Also at COP28, 125 countries endorsed the UAE Declaration on Climate and Health, strengthening their commitment to collaborate on human, animal, and environmental challenges through a One Health approach by addressing the environmental determinants of health by strengthening research on the linkages between environmental and climatic factors, as well as antimicrobial resistance, and by intensifying efforts for the early detection of zoonosis and zoonotic spillovers. Yet another golden opportunity is by mainstreaming biodiversity in our food system transformation efforts. In 2020, WHO developed guidance on mainstreaming biodiversity for nutrition and health to maximize co-benefits and minimize trade-offs associated with food production, processing, and consumption. Numerous concrete examples and integrated indicators are also provided in that guidance. Fifth, we have an opportunity to work across sectors to implement the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework adopted at the 15th Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which calls upon all countries to implement its 23 targets in line with a One Health approach. And most recently, the 77 World Health Assembly in May adopted a landmark resolution on climate change and health, recognizing the complex multidimensional challenges posed by climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. To support member states in developing national strategies for sustainable and climate resilient health systems, the resolution calls for capacity building and training on the interdependence between climate and health, also in line with a One Health approach, and importantly, calls for the development of a new global plan of action on climate and health, providing yet another golden opportunity for governments to ensure that prevention will be at its core as it is developed. Looking forward, 
The ongoing pandemic treaty negotiation process also offers a continued opportunity to embed One Health principles into the application of what are now more ambitious international health regulations, ensuring that our responses to pandemics are inclusive, multi-sectoral, comprehensive, but not just focused on preparedness and response, but also, and importantly, on prevention. These are only some of the numerous opportunities available to meet the breadth of the challenges we face with ambition and policy coherence. A One Health approach is not just a nice to have. It is essential to our efforts to transform our dysfunctional global food systems in the throes of this triple planetary crisis. It is up to each and every one of us to ensure that we create the conditions to bring it to fruition. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to onward collaboration on these critical issues. Let's jump right back in, and panelists, thank you for your patience. Uh, Marcel, I'm going to turn to you uh, with a question. The audience may not be aware of this, but it's quite impressive. You've worked on food security issues in Africa and in the Netherlands. Uh, for several years. You were then appointed the Dutch Climate Envoy, as I mentioned before, and you now work on food system related issues in Rome. I'm wondering if you could share more about the dual challenge of meeting food security goals without breaching climate limits and the extent to which you see policy moving forward in this direction. Yeah, thank you, Megan. And actually, I would like to start by saying that to, for me, this is not a dual challenge. This is, is one integrated challenge. And, and the beauty of the, the food systems approach is that it integrates all these and all related challenges. And I think that's best illustrated by, uh, and I'm sure you know it, the, uh, the wedding cake, the SDG wedding cake that the Stockholm Resilience Center um, published in, in 2016 already. And that, that shows that food systems are to the center of, of all these sustainable development goals. Mm. Um, at that time, in 2015, when the, the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted by the, uh, uh, the, the United Nations, uh, the Secretary General asked the so-called Milano Group to, um, to think of a way to integrate all these SDGs through a food systems lens. And um, uh, I happened to be involved in a group of experts that, that followed up, and, and we published a paper in, in 2018 uh, it was called Food Systems for Sustainable Development, and it contained proposals for a four-part transformation. And let me just summarize it in, in, with those four points. Um, we said back then that food systems should enable all people to benefit from nutritious and healthy food. Secondly, that it should reflect sustainable agricultural production and food value chains. Thirdly, that it should mitigate climate change and build resilience. And fourthly, food systems should encourage a renaissance of rural territories. Well, mm -hmm. that, that thinking has evolved since. Um, and I think, and, and you mentioned it in, in your introduction already, there are a few international events that I think um, illustrate that the, the thinking has, has moved into the right direction. And the first one that I would like to mention is the 2021 United Nations Food Systems Summit that really elevated it to uh, to leaders level, and then COP28 in uh, in 2023. Um, that food systems summit uh, helped us to to look through a food systems lens and 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 connect all these dots and have a more holistic approach to uh, to the necessary transformation. And the COP, as you mentioned uh, last year saw two interesting developments. The one was the, the, the roadmap that you mentioned, and I will say something more about that later, but it's, it's interesting that also the, the, the UN body that is responsible for food and agriculture um, tried to, to integrate it all into a, a roadmap, which is rather than a, a, a document that analyzes it, is more of a process kind of document that helps to convene people, countries, and other stakeholders into this kind of thinking. And, and the, the horizon for that is two years, uh, which I think is still pretty short, but it, it, it helps us to, uh, to have that conversation amongst ourselves. And the other one is the, the UAE declaration that you mentioned. Indeed, 160 signatories now, 
uh, with a promise to review all the um, um, the items that were contained in there at, at COP29, so already uh, next year. And that is, uh, or this year, I should say. And um, read it again. This this document is, although it's it's not action oriented, everything is in there. And since it's signed by leaders, and and I would say that to all participants in this in this uh, webinar, hold your leaders accountable because it, these are the connections that we are looking for, and they signed for it. Just to to keep it brief, uh, Megan. Um, for the sake of today's debate, um, I would like to make three points. The one, the first one is zoom out to that systems level where you will, may see the trade-offs, the mutual benefits. In other words, uh, use a food systems approach to, um, uh, to, to the issues at hand. Um, we're slowly getting there, but uh, I would say the proof of the pudding is really in the eating at national level where everything comes together, but also there we could benefit from, from that systems approach. My second point, diversify um, mm -hmm. at all levels. The, the microbiome in our gut is the same as the soil in which we farm. And the more diverse, the healthier and more resilient it is. Um, and, and again, if we, we zoom out here, we come to almost to the global level and we see that we are also too dependent on a, on a few staple crops mentioned wheat rice maize uh, which is a threat to the resilience of our global food system in itself so also their diversification is key my third point and i'm sure this will be core to our debate today is reduce animal sourced food consumption and between brackets again in developed countries this is the core of our problems. It's it's uh, if we would do that, we would have a triple benefit: uh, uh, human health, animal welfare, planetary health. Um, I won't go deeper into it now. I think Cleo already uh, um, referred to it, uh, but that I think is is key to uh, to the transformation that we are looking for. For all three points, um, it's context specific. This story is different in a country like the Netherlands, uh, as opposed to Kenya, for example. Um, and in some lower income countries, there might be a benefit to actually increase animal sourced food. But overall, to our global food system, a reduction or a move from, from um, animal source to other kinds of, of proteins is, uh, is key. Secondly, only touching up upon that briefly, there's a socio-economic side to this. And then I, I mentioned living income, the right to food, but also, and I think FAIR is doing quite a bit of work on that, the uh, the interests of big agri firms um, that, that benefit from the system as it is, and that we may have to talk about sooner or later. And then just in terms of definitions, when we talk about climate or when we talk about the ecological side of things, it includes all planetary crises, climate, biodiversity, pollution, water, and so on and on. So, so that's just for the sake of brevity, I refer to climate, but of course, this is, is broader than that. Finally, um, just to illustrate it with a, um, a, 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 an example from the Netherlands and, and to illustrate a little bit that we try to walk the talk in the Netherlands, in 2022, um, our parliament adopted a national protein strategy um, and it contains some of the things that I just mentioned. Uh, we try to lower our global footprint. So also reduce the, 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 the footprint or the imports of, for example, soy. Um, that's on the one hand to, uh, to, to be less dependent on um, inputs that come from far, but also uh, for the sake of, of global health and, and, and global uh, ecological reasons. It it's, um, pushes for the development of alternatives, including insect sourced food, uh, cultivated meat, another direction that we could talk about. And thirdly, what I mentioned as my last point, it also proposes to change the balance towards more plant-based diets. That is a process undergoing. And as you know, the Netherlands is a big producer of, um, of, of animal sourced uh, protein or of, of livestock. And that needs to change for all kinds of reasons. But our parliament already decided that we have to make this shift. So that is uh, for the sake of discussion. I stop here. And uh, I'm, I'm really curious to hear the others uh, on these points. Thank you so much, Marcel. I would be delighted. And I think the whole uh, audience could see considerable benefit in having a 
an entire evening uh, uh, delving into much of what you said, but you've summed it up very nicely and concisely. And I do hope we touch back on many of those themes as our discussion carries on today. Um, Natish, I wanted to touch in with you. We're hearing more and more about risks around AMR and zoonotic disease, such as avian flu. Uh, could you tell us more about how food systems contribute to these risks and how the risks can be mitigated? But before you do so, I've just been told of one other housekeeping thing. Apparently some people have, have raised their hands with questions. We ask please that you put the questions in the question box. And Natish, back to you about how food systems can contribute, how they currently contribute to these risks of AMR and zoonotic diseases and how the risks can be mitigated. Thank you, Megan. Thank you very much. And as you all know that, you know, we are passing through a very important crisis time, particularly with the pandemic. That's what, uh, you know, we are listening from very many corners. Uh, one pandemic is over, uh, hopefully, but, you know, antimicrobial resistance, we consider it as another silent pandemic. And it is a very multi-sectoral issue, and that's why we call this the One Health Agenda. But most importantly, you know, research highlights that foods may become the, you know, the most important uh, issue for the antimicrobial uh, resistance. And it is also important that, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, becoming an issue for uh, lower and middle income country because the research also demonstrates that foodborne disease pathogens are primary cause of morbidity and mortality in many of the uh, LMIC countries. And to spread this pathogenic bacteria from food to consumers may occur by direct or indirect routes, and therefore in a rare of approach, both at the national and international level to control the spread of pathogens and promote a food safety and security are very essential. When we say that, it is not a very easy job as I said, you know, um, it has been antimicrobial use in the food system uh, is huge, quite a lot. Although nowadays there are a lot of awareness and World Organization of Animal Health has been telling that the use of antibi antibiotics in the animal production system is reducing, but it is still considered to be one of the important uh, risks. And what can we do for that? You know, the most important thing is that we need to really reduce uh, on, on what basis. We need to create the evidence. And that's what we call that for antimicrobial resistance reduction, the most important activities is to create evidence where it is happening and what is the root of that one. How is it impacting the human health? It's not only the food system. There are other causes. But if, as far as food system is concerned, as we are discussing today, we need to really uh, create an evidence. And for that thing, uh, we need to go for a regular surveillance for antimicrobial resistance uh, in the food system as such, including the animal origin, as well as some of the environmental sectors involvement with the animal production, we need to do that. And one most important thing is that, you know, the use of antibiotics in animal production got to be reduced at a very, very minimum level unless, you know, while well, animals are sick and then you can really those this. So the emergence of uh, those uh, antimicrobial resistance can only be mitigated with an integrated approach and more importantly, uh, you know, integration of food system with the other uh, health uh, 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 approaches for mitigating the antimicrobial resistance is very important. And that has already started, basically. Uh, you know, this, uh, there are multi-country uh, trust fund we have created by WHO, FAO, Y, and you know, and also there are other very international players are acting to develop some sort of surveillance system in the develop, developing country. And developed country as well, they have those things. But the most important thing that we need to make a decision based on the evidence and for that thing, the strong recommendation is to conduct the, uh, uh, you know, uh, surveillance uh, along the food system or food. So I would like to uh, put this point here, but most important one that you have also asked me to respond about the uh, avian influenza, you know, the, since the emergence of new lineage of H5N1 in 1996, these viruses have been evolved into multiple plates and genotype. That's no more a one virus, you know. 
It is getting it is getting genetic mutations, antigenic drift, as well as complex pattern of resortment for gene segments during continued circulation in poultry farms with insufficient uh, biosecurity and recycling of spillovers and spillbacks between poultry and wild birds operation. But you know, a recent sus suspected foodborne incident led to infection of multiple domestic cats across Poland, including death where cats uh, had a neurological as well as respiratory signs. What is highlighted that the risk of other possible rules of exposure among pig, uh, uh, previously reported captive tigers and lions because of some cats had no access to other outdoor. Similar clinical findings were seen in recent times in the USA, uh, likely cattle, you know, to cat transmission. While this risk of infection in humans is still considered low, and there have been only few reported human infection with current global spreading, uh, but it is clear that this virus has been infected a wide range of mammalian species efficiently and most likely attributes to the very high prevalence of the virus in multiple wild birds as well. And as a result, this prevalence in animals could result in high risk for humans. And most recently, you know, the two, three, three, what we call uh, two, three, four, four B viruses were identified in clinically ill dairy cows and un unpasteurized milk as well. So for those things, what we can really do, the first expansion of this virus and the resulting spillover in far and farmed animals and wild carnivores can be used as a sort of preparedness scenarios, asking for instance, for example, are we able to detect emerging circulation among domestic species, such as cattle, pigs, far animals, humans in a sufficiently uh, manner to allow for early containment? We have now a better understanding what global far animals industry looks like, but we have very little uh, surveillance system here as well. For that thing, what we are recommending, you know, very recently, WFAO and World Organization for Animal Health has developed a sort of 10 years program. And, and the objective of that pathway to change is prevent the SPI epidemic and a pangeotic and negative impact on the biodiversity through multi-sectoral early detection and control, protect poultry value chain, livelihoods, trade, and the health of humans, ecosystem, and other animals from avian influenza impacts, and transform whole tree value chains to improve you know, the resilience to avian influenza and other disease threats. So these are the few comments at the moment. I would like to uh, conclude here that these two important diseases or threats, hazards, are really very, very important for human health, for the biodiversity, as well as for wildlife, and of course, it is impacting quite a lot on our poultry industry. Thank you. I would like to conclude. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Nikesh. That was that was very uh, rich and filled with interesting and important information. Uh, and in your conclusion there about all of the different impacts, both on humans and on animals, those who are uh, kept by humans uh, to produce food, and also wildlife, and then obviously environment. It, it pretty well sews up what uh, why these issues are referred to as One Health and why it's really of limited use to try to fix it just in one sphere, but you have to be looking across. So, so thank you very much. Uh, Cleo, I have a question for you. Uh, SE, uh, SEI's recent work has spotlighted how food system transformation can create new opportunities, but also risks for public health. Could you elaborate on this? Yeah, thank you, Megan. Um, so just to recognize, first of all, that um, as, as Mar Marcel was saying, there are so many different elements to food system transformation from diversification of the food system, tackling food waste to reconsidering our use of pesticides. Um, but that animal agriculture really is one of the main areas of focus uh, in terms of where we need to reduce emissions and generally uh, animal um, agriculture is responsible for, for other um environmental challenges as well. And of course, the environment is directly related to One Health. It's one key component of it. Um, but this is increasingly recognized the FAO's 1.5 degree uh, roadmap for achieving zero hunger. 
uh, without um, reaching climate limits, uh, highlights the livestock sector as the first domain of action. Um, and we know that the sector generally needs to change drastically to align with climate limits. So the question is not, does the sector need to change, but but how? Um, and, and the paper you, you referred to, Megan, um, it's, it, it was published quite recently. We, we can put the, the link in the chats um, and published together with researchers from Harvard University, New York University, University of Santa Catarina in Brazil and Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, and what it did, it looked at uh, seven commonly proposed and pursued interventions um, that are um, increasingly being adopted in to uh, reduce emissions from the farmed animal sector. And these seven interventions, we sort of organized across three buckets. So the first bucket is sustainable intensification type intervention. So this involves, for instance, raising animals together um, in, in closer quarters to use less land, um, which is a way of farming them more efficiently. Um, genetic selection to, uh, to make animals more productive and feed changes. The second bucket uh, we, we considered was species shift approaches. So for, for instance, shifting from uh, beef to chicken and fish, but also sometimes uh, shifting to, to insect farming. And the third bucket was more systemic dietary shifts. So uh, th these approaches emphasize more pl whole plant-based diets, but could also include investments in uh, the alternative protein sector, for instance. And all of these uh, interventions are happening across different countries uh, in different degrees, but both governments as well as the private sector are pursuing these types of policies already. And international organizations are also regularly sort of suggesting and recommending them. Um, so what we find in the paper is, is first of all, from an environmental perspective, uh, that some of these interventions actually might have a bit of a mixed track record. Uh, one reason for that is, for instance, uh, the rebound effect. So uh, when you make production more efficient, it's possible that this will lower prices to, to uh, so much of a degree that actually it increases consumption, sort of undoing some of the efficiencies that you might see, for instance, through sustainable intensification. And there's some evidence that that could take place in the food system. Um, but in addition, shifting to food systems like uh, poultry farming or aquaculture can still have quite significant environmental impacts uh, for air pollution, water pollution, for instance. And then there's also questions with um, with insect farming that SEI has been looking at uh, in, in depth more recently, um, where a lot of the insects that are currently being farmed are actually being um, fed to farmed animals or the aquaculture industry rather than sort of uh, displacing um, traditional animal protein or sort of provide uh, forming an input into mm -hmm. that sector. So that's also something to monitor in terms of are these uh, from even from an environmental perspective, always uh, very promising solutions. But then from a public health perspective, that's really um, the, the meat of the paper, if you will. Um, so we find that uh, quite a lot of the, uh, the interventions that we looked at have a potential risk of uh, increasing or maintaining risks of antimicrobial resistance, as well as zoonotic disease emergence. So intensification of animal farming can be associated with, with both those risks because um, yeah, animals farmed in, in close quarters um, may be more susceptible to disease, to spreading it to each other. Antibiotics are routinely used in the industrial animal uh, agriculture um, practices. Um, poultry farming as well. We've seen an, a decrease in antibiotic use in the poultry sector um, in quite a few high income countries recently, but globally it still uh, represents a significant challenge. Um, and, and infectious disease emergence certainly is a, is a challenge, uh, as we're seeing with the avian influenza crisis at the moment. Uh, and with aquaculture as well, antimicrobials um, are used uh, routinely in the sector, and that's also uh, something that's expected to grow. 
Um, so that's something we really highlight is, yeah, there, there might be climate benefits in, in certain cases um, with some of these interventions, but if you look at it more holistically, there might also be um, potential new risks. And so it's important to, to look at uh, all the different sides of these interventions. And I just want to mention briefly as well that um, there's a strong focus on public health in the paper, but we also look um, at animal welfare related implications. Animal welfare has been recognized by the One Health High Level Expert Panel as relevant to the impl implementation of One Health um, approaches. And several of these um, interventions, such as uh, shifting from beef to chickens or farmed fish, might actually exacerbate many uh, animal welfare concerns because of the, the type of environment in which these animals are kept, but also the sheer scale, the number of animals that would be needed if you're shifting from beef to chicken. I think it's something like 125 chickens for the equivalent amount of one cow. And so that's really something I think that um, that we should be at least cognizant of when we're recommending and pursuing policies um, in this space is how does this this influence animal welfare because uh, animal welfare is directly related to One Health, but also because many citizens care about animal welfare as a standalone issue. Um, and of course, there's a lot of science um, about sort of the the cognitive abilities, the experiences that animals are having. We're learning more and more about this as an important area in and of itself. Um, I'll wrap up, but just to say that our paper does find that there are some types of interventions, more in that third bucket I was talking about, the systemic dietary shifts uh, that are associated with more win-win solutions for both climate change as well as public health and animal welfare. So those are shifts towards more plant-based, whole plant-based diets, as well as these uh, exploring investments in the alternative protein sector. Uh, we do really recognize that that is uh, a potential challenge in some reg regions. Uh, equity and access remain an issue. It's not uh, necessarily possible that all these food systems are, um, are a possibility in every region. But uh, at the same time, they do these pathways do seem underexplored in relevant regions. So there's an opportunity there for really pursuing win-win solutions that are good for a more holistic um, approach to policy. Um, and that's really what the paper ends with, a plea to approach these, these issues in a more holistic way. So, um, so we do more of those pursuing synergies and, and less of the trade-offs. Thank you so much, Cleo. And as was true with uh, Natish and uh, with Marcel, I think an entire evening could be spent unpicking what you've discussed. And in the remaining time to us, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting interactivity between uh, the, the points that you three have already made. But let us turn quickly to just further enrich ourselves and give us even more interesting things to discuss. Uh, uh, Masika, I have um, want to flag for the audience, you know, you've worked directly as a veterinarian with small uh, share small holder livestock farmers in Kenya. And I wanted to have a sense from you how these systems currently integrate one health approach and what are the challenges they face compared to industrialized farming systems. Thank you so much, so much Megan. And I wanted to say that I really like the point that Marcel made about ensuring that we are cognizant of different national contexts, because it's mm -hmm. very important that I like the diversity within the panel to speak about the Netherlands and Kenya, because our systems are different in many different ways. So please allow me to just set the scene and elaborate how important livestock farming is in Kenya and the type of uh, livestock farming uh, that Kenya does uh, being smallholder uh, farming. So Kenya's economy, like most of the African countries, are very much dependent on agriculture. And agriculture significantly is contributed by livestock farming. So you can see how important livestock farming is within the agricultural system of Kenya and most of the other African countries. Now, for farmers or the smallholder farmers in Kenya, Livestock is not just um, for food, it provides, it plays many other roles. It provides a means of livelihood, uh, alleviation of poverty, nutrition, and many other cultural purposes. Uh, but I have to mention that for most of the, the cultural context within the, the farming system in Kenya, animals and people are not seen as different entities. 
a lot of the households in Kenya, both in, some in urban areas, peri-urban and rural areas, keep animals more than even one species. People have chicken, people have goats within their households. And this is the way of life that majority of the Kenyan people live. So we have lived in a more holistic way with our animals and with our environment. Now, the other thing I want to mention is some of the examples that having worked with smallholder farmers in Kenya on how they are incorporating the One Health approach in living harmoniously with animals and nature. I will mention an example of uh, the pastoralist community in Kenya who are largely multi-species um, farmers, so to say, because they keep camel, they keep goat, they keep um, cattle, and they move from one place to another to ensure that the animals are well fed, to ensure that they, they themselves are well fed from the animals. So they prioritize the health of the animals first because they know they need the nutrition or the food from the animals. And the third thing, they also prioritize the environment. So when it gets dry, because most of the pastoralists are from the drier part of Kenya, they will move from one region to another to allow that part that is drier to regenerate. So there's an element of ensuring that this habitat uh, preservation, and as they're, as they're moving from one area to another, there's you know, seed dispersal because the animals are feeding from the plants and during the, uh, you know, the fecal matter disposes the, the uh, the seeds into the environment and basically they they ensure that they really retain the indigenous species of the animals and if there is a very little integration between the exotic and the indigenous is to ensure that we retain animals that are resilient to the environment uh, to the diseases within the environment they're resilient to the environment that these people are used to living in instead of introduction of um, exo exotic breeds that would need additional care and would experience different uh, health implications uh, now, the second example is about diseases, because obviously, um, no matter what you do in this system, there's always going to be diseases. What the local farmers do is there's, there's a lot of knowledge um, from the local communities, from the smallholder farmers. And before even the modern medicine arrived, these people were surviving um, on their own. Their animals were thriving. So there's knowledge. They may not call diseases with the English name that we know, but they call them in their native languages. They know what needs to be done to to these animals and they know what needs to be done to the environment. So even the, the local you know, um, health uh, authorities, they will go to the local farmers to gather this information because the local farmers, they know how the ecosystem is changing. They know where the vectors are and they know how and, and where and who are affected by, for instance, um, vectors or diseases within their own region. So there's a very key element in utilizing local farmers uh, knowledge in reporting of signals. For instance, before malaria or Rift Valley fever occurs, they will report an increase uh, amount of rainfall within a certain region, which would increase the vector, the mosquito vector population. And lastly, I want to mention that uh, what the other, um, uh, the smallholder farmers also encourage because of limited resources, obviously, is when we have um, health interventions, um, is to ensure that, for instance, if a, a local health authority is holding a medical camp, they will also hold it alongside the animal health camp so that there is utilization of resources at the same time and limit wastages. And this is basically what we are talking about when we talk about uh, our One Health approach. But obviously this system does not have, um, does not lack challenges. And one of the key challenges, there are many challenges with diseases and limited resources and limited access to you know, health services. But one of this, uh, the challenge I have to mention is um, the gender angle, because like I mentioned, the livestock uh, system or the farming system in Kenya has a very huge social and gender angle. Two thirds of the livestock farmers in Kenya are women. And these are the people who raise the animals, they're the people who stay milk the, anim the animals if they want milk, they're the people who know the ins and outs of the diseases within their households. But unfortunately, they are often um, not included when it comes to decision making and interventions um, when they really are at the heart of uh, livestock farming in Kenya. And this increases... Uh, I've really, this is a risk because uh, without inclusion of women in decision making and during interventions, it poses a high risk to them because they're the ones in contact with the animals. They're the ones preparing the food. They are the ones who are handling, you know, the animal products. So in case of a disease outbreak, the first people to be affected within a household are women and 
then children, then the men. So uh, without inclusion or prioritization of women at the, on these systems, we are not really doing it justice because women really hold a, a huge power in deciding what we are eating today, home, how, how is it being cooked, when is it being cooked, how many people will eat. So they, they do really hold a lot of power when it comes to changing perceptions, you know, building resilience to, uh, to climate change, influencing and even showing the correlation between empowering a woman and how that directly results in, you know, good results and food transformation. Thank you. Oh, Masika, thank you very much. Uh, again, such a lot of richness there. Um, I'd like to turn, if I could, to a question for all of you, um, reflecting on what you've what you've said so far. It's pretty clear that moving forward uh, toward food systems that are resilient, sustainable, and ensure sufficient nutrition and sustenance for the world's population and its growing population depends on reducing the extent to which the agri-food sector contributes to nature loss, climate change, antimicrobial resistance, and you know pandemics of zoonotic origin. Um, solutions that address one of these risks but exacerbate the others have limited role to play in a viable path forward. Um, you've touched on many of these threads and their interconnectedness in, in your comments. Um, and I guess my question to you all is building out from there, what are the policy and practical implications from today's discussion? And are there particular upcoming opportunities that you see to move these issues forward in a more holistic way. Um, and I guess I would, um, sorry about that. Were you able to hear any of what I had just said? We just you missed the last sentence. sentence. Oh, so the very last sentence was uh, about asking you whether or not kind of building out from, from what we've had as our discussion, what are the policy and practical implications of the issues we've discussed and whether you can see some uh, particular upcoming opportunities to move these issues forward in a holistic way. And I'd love to hear from, from all of you um, or any of you who wish to speak. And uh, uh, I guess owing to the fact that Masika has just been speaking, I would turn to uh, perhaps Marcel, we'll just kind of go in order again, just for the purpose of, of keeping some ease here. But if one doesn't wish to speak or somebody else is keen, then do just just jump in. No, I'm, I'm happy to kick it off. And, and uh, I agree that listening to, um, to all speakers, there are so many interrelated issues here. Um, this, this underscores the value of having a food systems approach. But at the same time, it also makes it very theoretical. Uh, how are you going to do that in practice? And one challenge that we have is, is we can agree that we need to transform our food systems, um, but there are basically two, two dominant ways to look at it. The one is we try to optimize the system as we know it and, and reduce it neg its negative effects and, and uh, with, with, by means of innovation and technological solutions, uh, mitigate the negative effects and, and move forward. The other approach is, um, as I said in the beginning, zoom out and look at, at a, um, all those negative effects, uh, but also as, as some of the other colleagues said, the, 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 the benefits that we may have by combining uh, issues into a new system. And that is um, very hard because, and I mentioned that in the beginning as well, um, some uh, big players in the current system may have an interest in keeping it as it is and um, uh, trying to address some of the, 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 the flaws of the system or their negative effects, um, mm -hmm. advocate for their um, resolve to, to change it and, and to improve it um, without addressing the, the fundamental questions that some of the speakers have addressed, like changing a diet or um, uh, spatial planning in a different way, integrating different functions in, into our land. And that is, there, there needs some, some, there needs to be some direction. And in most countries, and especially those countries that are democratically run, that should be the government with the involvement of the people to, to look to the longer term and say, okay, what are we going to change to actually 
get to a new equilibrium in our societies mm -hmm. and in our food systems? And that is the very hard question. And we need to, um, uh, to, yeah, to talk about it and see what the negative effects are and not being uh, distracted by what um, some writers and some authors have called the merchants of doubt that try to insert parts of the truth or sometimes even fake science into it, um, base ourselves on, uh, on on proper science and, and on, on the knowledge that we currently have, including the indigenous knowledge that I think Masika also spoke about, mm -hmm. find the pathway forward towards a more resilient food system. I hope that makes sense a little bit, uh, Megan. It makes a great deal of sense. And I think it's really important to address uh, the question of, of political will and of politics and how when you know that there really, there could be whatever politics and negotiations have to happen, in the end, um, climate change is going to carry on. Uh, and so so it's not up for uh, political compromises. It, it, it Ultimately, we need to take seriously the existential threat that it is, the biodiversity losses and, um, and the possibility of, uh, of future very serious pandemics whether they're the silent form of AMR or otherwise. And so that is a really tricky question in democracy. Um, if, if the populace isn't uh, in focus on something or if elected officials um, on their own or because of the interactions that they have with industry um, um, associations who are scared of change, how do you bring about an atmosphere in which what needs to happen can and does happen? Uh, and I think, it's, a, it's an incredibly important and tricky one. Um, uh, 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 Natish, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have in response to my question about some of the policy and practical implications of our discussion and opportunities to move these issues forward. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think Marcel as well as Silio, uh, Silio uh, at the beginning made some good comment. I would like to uh, focus in one particular area related to the production system, particularly the food production system, including crop production, as well as livestock, poultry, all those things. You know, the message that we are trying to give as a sort of holistic approach is not reaching out to the farmer level or community level. It is still at the very higher level. And holistic approach is very essential at the moment. If you really divert that approach uh, as sort of win-win situation, farmers, you know, produce things for benefit of his own economy, as well as to supply uh, continuity of the supply. And in managing this balance, I think a sort of new agricultural approach is very essential. And that agricultural approach includes three important things. One, a sort of holistic approach, you know, how you can really mitigate. Uh, say, for example, we are producing poultry at the lower income, middle income country. And those mostly are very uh, small scale uh, poultry production. But in terms of small scale poultry production, they are not really uh, managing them properly in terms of biosecurity and biosafety, all those measures. What they are doing now is really to keep their birds alive. They are excessively using antibiotics. And that sort of campaign you need to bring about at the farmer level. It is not only about the poultry. It is also about using the herbicides, pesticides, and all other things in the crop production system. And that agricultural system will basically promote less use of all those uh, you know, harmful effects. On the other hand, really provide the pathway from very scientific way that how they can keep the production at that level and even can increase. And that science is available, and but, as it is a very silo based, and the message of the impact of the uh, you know loss of biodiversity uh, impacting the environmental uh, you know contaminations and all these things, this message at least at the a lower and middle income countries are not reaching in a very proper way. So uh, a sort of new movement of the agricultural production system, and including you know this welfare issue. Uh, of the animal welfare issue at the farmer level, particularly if you think about the uh, you know lower and middle income country, they are not reaching there. And for that thing, a sort of uh, you know joint uh, initiative is essential at local and national level 
and of course guidance can come from the upper level uh, like you know all this quadripartite and other things and for that thing i think a new agricultural approach is essential with the objective of three things one you cannot maintain you have to maintain the uh, environment and biodiversity second that you will reduce the uses of all these uh, uh, you know materials that are impacting health not only human health impacting all other health including the environmental health and third thing a sort of agricultural new approach you know green revolution was once upon a time only focusing on production and production we need to make a sort of balance it is not only production and you have to be a sustainable production and for that thing you need to keep your soil health animal health environmental health all together viable and sustainable to support that production system and for that thing and new agriculture things are coming up and in a but still it is not reaching out to the farmer level so i will strongly recommend that a sort of community engagement movement is necessary for agricultural production system over thank you very much uh, natish and uh... Cleo and uh, Masita, I'd like to hear Masika, I'd like to hear uh, anything that either of you two have to say, and then we'll move to some of the other questions. But in no way do I want you to feel shortchanged in the answer, because I think this is such a rich opportunity for, for each of you, for each of the four panelists, to sort of reflect on what's been said and some of the top takeaways to share with the, the audience. So uh, Cleo, to you. Thanks, Megan. And I'll keep it quite brief because I see some interesting questions coming in in the chat about, you know, the, the tensions around intensification in Africa from Asika. And I'm also really curious about her answer there, as well as on um, political power of, of some of these uh, big industries, what we do about that. There's a question from Marcel that I'm also very curious about. Um, but in terms of um, policy solutions, I mean, it all comes down to taking a holistic approach and realizing that it's incredibly costly not not to do so right it's economically costly the 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 human toll is costly when we are talking about issues like food security uh, antimicrobial resistance pandemic threats are actually huge risks to food security so it's really in every actor's interest to be thinking about these issues more holistically if we want to have a sust more sustainable and resilient um, food system. Um, so very concretely, in terms of what the climate community could be paying attention to is that we have the, um, the um, submission of uh, nationally determined contributions coming up next year as part of the uh, international climate process. Their uh, governments have committed, or many governments have committed, to pay more attention to food systems. And when they do that, there's really an opportunity to link the link those responses to One Health, to consider animal welfare as well, to ensure that basically the climate's interventions are more broadly sustainable, uh, and not not only from an emissions perspective. Um, I think international organizations have a key role to play here by sort of setting the right narrative and sort of highlighting how these issues interconnect. Uh, the FAO's 1.5 degree roadmap process is a really important opportunity to link these issues holistically. Um, it was interesting to see in the World Bank recent report on agri-food systems that they actually talk a bit about animal welfare and how different interventions uh, might have co-benefits for animal welfare. I think that's um, yeah, quite a progressive approach um, that we haven't seen that much um, in international organizations work so far. Um, but that report, um, I think, does not pay that much attention to uh, antimicrobial resistance and zoonotic disease risks. So there's a potential opportunity there to, to bring that in more. Um, generally, the global financial system obviously has a huge role to play in making our food system more sustainable and more healthy. Uh, the private sector, we've actually been approached in the past by uh, private sector organizations who highlight this tension between sustainability and animal welfare and trying to figure this out. So it's really important that we um, explore solutions together and, and not um, have um, sustainability come at the cost of animal welfare and health. Um, and just also to highlight there, there are some interesting tools available. Scientists have worked on a uh, just one health impact assessment tool that policymakers and other actors could perhaps start applying in different contexts to to um, assess the broader impact 
of different uh, policies on one health and sustainability. And I think there's really also an opportunity for scientists to do more um, cross sectoral collaboration in these areas, because it is quite easy to be sort of stuck in your area uh, without necessarily thinking about the broader um, implications of different policies. So the uh, encouragement and invitation for the scientific community to take a more holistic approach to thanks. And uh, as a former uh, uh, trade negotiator and uh, uh, and also with my current hat on, I would say that's really important for the scientists. It's also really important for policymakers. And it is a much more awkward conversation. Um, but unless you tie the pieces together and you really have people weighing in from their various areas of expertise on, on this, um, you're, you have a great risk of arriving at solutions that uh, that aren't fit for purpose. So uh, I hear your call out to scientists and I echo it for policymakers. So I would like to, and I'm just very aware of our time, I would like to hear from you, Masika, and perhaps in answering it, you could weave in an answer to the one question uh, that Cleo flagged. And then if we have time, Marcel, I'd love to turn to the, to the question that came to you. And that may be that those are the only two that we can get to. And if not, we might be able to squeeze another one in. Uh, this just shows a, a great appetite and desire for more discussion on this. And so I think uh, one of the big takeaways here is, is that uh, that there is a great deal of interest and a great deal of, uh, of curiosity and, and questions. And so hopefully these conversations can continue again on other days and, and in other fora. Uh, but to you, Masika. Thank you, Megan. I'm gonna answer your question by answering two of the other questions that were raised in the chat. And as Cleo and everyone is talking, I'm actually, more ideas are coming into my head, but we only have, we already 10 minutes past time, so I'll keep it very short. So the first oh, question- so Just was, so you know, we're, we, are, we are actually still four minutes ahead of time. Oh, perfect, perfect. But yeah. Okay, thank you. So my answer to the first question, uh, the first question about, you know, the tension in Africa currently, for intensification of livestock and retention of our old way of farming systems. It's very real. A lot of governments are going through these conversations and um, I hope they are involving the communities in these conversations because as I mentioned, smallholder farmers hold the majority um, of these economies uh, within the agricultural system. Now, anything that requires you not to think and borrow an idea from somewhere else and apply it in a different region without thinking there's nothing good about that. You cannot borrow a system from somewhere else and apply it in your own region because you don't want to think, because you don't want to look at the, at mm. the national context. So you have to, there are systems that are working in the West. What can we borrow from that? What is working from these modern systems? And we have, we, I'm very cognizant of the fact that for the low and middle income countries who are very amongst the population who um, are not food, entirely food secure and uh, not nutritionally apt, we need to increase the production to ensure that our people are fed and well fed, but we have to do it in a way that benefits our people. If we apply mm -hmm. a system that has worked in the West and when it's brought to Kenya, for instance, for instance, the industrialization of the livestock farming systems, and all our farmers lose their livelihoods. I mentioned in the beginning, livestock farming in Kenya is not only for food, it's also for livelihoods. It's to ensure that women have money, it's to ensure that children are able to go to school. We really are not working for our people, we're not serving our people. So as Nitish said, it's important that we engage our communities in different countries to see what is the need. How can the mm -hmm. community contribute to this conversation? Because you cannot speak for the community when the community are at the center of this. Um, I mean, I come from a farming community, but I am not farming right now. But there, there's a bigger community that is depending on livestock. And the elimination of that type of system without considering them does not benefit us as a country. Now, the other thing I want to mention that Cleo has mentioned is financing. Financing, um, even this uh, tension between uh, intensification and smallholder farming is because there's a lot of money being child or offered to Africa to intensify our livestock or our livestock farming systems. But we need to ensure that our financing is fair. We need a financing system that actually looks at the community, provides, yes, the financing because we need to increase the productivity, but it needs to look at it holistically. 
if you give money haphazardly and that money goes into creating industrial, industrialized farming systems cannot be done by smallholder farmers. They require a lot of money, they require a lot of financing, they require a lot of resources that our farmers do not have. So we cannot continue pushing what has worked in one country and push it for a country where it will harm the community more than benefit them. We need our community alive for them to enjoy the food we want to give them. Thank you so, so very much. Um, I'm aware that we have really just a minute from the end here. And um, so I, I don't think we have time for any other question unless, um, in fact, I just think that I was gonna try to let Marcel answer the question, but it, I know it to be too complica complicated of a question to be dealt with in 30 seconds, unless I you'd like to go for it, Marcel, do it. 30 seconds. What yeah. we are talking about here is the tragedy of the commons. And I saw a very beautiful uh, illustration of that in the chat from Tanzania, the tension between the pastoralists and uh, sedentary uh, farmers. The same can be said about the global level, big ag and others. And I think the key to that is what Masika referred to, is, is making transparent who benefits from what, where the finance flows, uh, but also like in the tragedy of the commons uh, at the local scale, sit together, uh, be clear about all interests and try to find a way forward for the longer term. If we don't do that, it goes to the detriment of the nature of the animals and ultimately also of people. So that within 30 seconds. Back to you, Megan. Well, so beautifully done. I think all that falls to me is to say thank you to all of you and thank you to everyone out in the audience. And again, thank you uh, to SEI and to the government of the Netherlands. It has been an enormous pleasure to, to be with you this period of time today. So thank you and goodbye.